today on the Horsepower Monster, we're living up to our name because we're building a monster of a big blown Hemi. God bless America. I love my job. Here we go. Big stroker, second gen Hemi, you know, the good one, with a giant blower on top. It's going to make big power, rumble at idle like an angry mastodon, and just be generally huge. Oh, and it's built to go into a 1969 Roadrunner. We love this stuff, and we know you do too. Let's get it on. For a few years now, it's been really hard to get a 426 Hemi block. Actually, let me correct that. For a few years now, it's been really hard to find good quality 426 Hemi blocks. But thankfully, Callie's and their sister company, Energy Manufacturing, have recently stepped in with a really nice 426 Hemi casting. Interestingly, Callie says these are made from original Mopar molds cores, and engineering data. Heck, they even carry legit Mopar part numbers. That's cool and all for the restoration guys, but we're more interested in performance capabilities. Things like a maximum bore of four inches, 600 thousandths, a 600 thousandths thick deck when the block is machined to the 10 inch .725 deck height, provisions for an external oil pickup passage to allow for stroker combos, and things like the benefits of modern casting technology. It's also our understanding that the casting isn't a direct OEM copy, but instead a beefed up version of the original that Fiat Chrysler provided the plans for. We'll be running a four inch 500,000 cylinder bore, which is slightly smaller than the max, but still quite a bit larger than the stock four and a quarter inch bore size. The crankshaft is a high strength forging from Monar. It takes a lot of power to spin a big blower with the engine running at over 6,000 RPM. So to give it a little extra strength, Larry Broker cuts a second keyway into the snout of the crank. An operation like this requires a skilled machinist because the new keyway must be exactly 180 degrees opposite the original and perfectly match the twin keyways cut into the damper. It's got to be a perfect fit with zero slop or else you can do more harm than good. The crank itself is a stroker forging Monar makes for the 426 Hemi. It punches out the stroke from the stock 3.750 inches to a full three quarters of an inch bigger at four inches 500 thousandths. The rod journals meanwhile have been reduced from the Hemi's beefy two and three quarter inches to Chevy big block size, two inches, 200 thousandths. Here, short block specialist Cody McCleary applies grease in preparation for a very cool part of this build that will never be noticed once the engine is complete. Instead of an old style, troublesome main seal, Prestige is using an updated, modern, one piece rear main seal that should help prevent annoying oil leaks down the road. An old Hemi that doesn't drip oil on your garage floor, that's sort of like spotting a unicorn in the wild. Once the crank is settled into the saddles, Cody installs the iconic four bolt main caps. These are ARP main bolts, which are much stronger than stock and each are torqued to hundred pounds. Next up, Cody preps the rear oil seal retainer. Now this is a billet piece and a little silicone in the side grooves will help the retainer seal against the block. Then, it just drops right into position behind the rearmost main cap. A final squirt of silicone in the grooves helps ensure the entire seal retainer is fully packed with silicone. And then he cleans up the excess and bolts the plate down. With that done, we can move on to the cross bolts for the main caps. The cross bolts secure the main caps through the skirt of the block. And if you aren't careful, oil can weep past the bolt and drip down the block. To keep this from happening, Cody applies a thin bead of silicone 
underneath the head of the bolt and also underneath the washer before threading the bolt into place. This process can get messy, but using a socket to hold the bolt while you apply the silicone definitely helps. The cross bolts are smaller than the main cap bolts, so they are only torqued to 40 foot-pounds. And with the crank secured in the block, we are ready to move on to the rest of the rotating assembly. Cody has already checked over the pistons and connecting rods and verified his bearing clearances. For the pistons, Prestige has gone with eight aluminum slugs from JE Pistons. These are custom ordered units specifically for this build. Each piston has a .225 dome to help keep the compression up with the giant combustion chambers in the 426 Hemi cylinder heads. The engine is square with both a bore and stroke of four inches 500 thousandths. So that means the final displacement will be a big old 572 and a half cubic inches. Anyhow, the JE pistons will connect to the crank via a set of Eagle H-beam connecting rods. They are big block Chevy spec with a big end to fit a 2 inch 200 thousandths journal and a .990 pin bore to fit with the 10 inch 690 thousandths deck of the block. These rods are 7 inches 100 thousandths long. Cody assembles the pistons on the rods and secures the wrist pins into their bores with a pair of spiral locks on each side. And last, before everything is ready to go, the rings are slid over the top of the piston and into the proper ring land. The top and second rings are both 43 thousandths thick and the oil ring is 3 millimeters. Because we'll be pushing boost and thus extra heat into the cylinders, the rings are gapped wide at 32 thousandths for the first two rings and 30 thousandths for the third. Once each of the rods and pistons are slid into the bores, the ARP cap screws are torqued to 75 pounds with molly lube on the threads. With the pistons in the block, you can see the dome that extends into the combustion chambers. Since we're running a blower, the compression is lower than typical in a naturally aspirated engine and the dome volume is only 40 cc's. That's significantly less than the typical 80 cc dome for these engines. Notice that a pocket for the exhaust valve isn't even necessary. Okay, let's move on to the valve train. The camshaft is a solid roller from Comp Cams. The customer said they wanted a great sounding lope and that classic blower surge at idle. And we are definitely down with that. Getting that surge is a little easier said than done when you're running fuel injection, but the guys at Prestige Motorsports know all the tricks to make it happen. That's why the cam is ground big. We're talking about 270 and 280 degrees of duration at 50 thousandths tappet lift for the intakes and exhausts. Lobe separation is 112 degrees and the gross valve lift with a set of 1.6 to 1 ratio rocker arms will be 628 thousandths for the intakes and 609 for the exhausts. Once the cam is in place, assembler Larry Broker connects it to the crankshaft with a billet double roller timing set. And then he degrees in the cam and makes sure that everything is timed up correctly. With that done, Larry applies a thin film of grease to the crank seal and installs the timing cover. The Innovator's West damper goes on next. The blower drive hub will bolt up to the damper, so it's been cut with two keyways to match up with the snout of the crank. That second key will help the damper hold up to the extra stress from having to spin up the blower. The oil pan is a center sump unit from Mylodon in their iconic gold iridite color. Here, Larry test fits the low car dipstick and marks it for the proper oil fill level. The pan is a road race unit with trap doors and baffling to hold oil around the pickup under both hard acceleration and braking. This one has a seven quart capacity and can handle a stroke of up to four and three quarters inches. As part of the design that handles all that stroke with just five and a half inches of depth, the pickup tube 
actually exits outside the pan. That's the fitting for it here. Now in a build that doesn't have our extreme four and a half inches of stroke, you can use the internal pickup with the Cali's block. Since we're not, this plate has been plugged to seal up the oil gallery. Notice how part of the bottom of the plug still had to be cut back to make room for the connecting rod as it swings by. A thin bead of silicone on either side of the oil pan gasket helps eliminate the chance of leaks down the road. And now the pan is ready to be lowered into place and bolted down tight. With the pan on, Larry spins the engine back right side up in preparation for installing the cylinder heads. The head gaskets are multi-layer steel and that copper color comes because they've been sprayed with a coat of copper gasket sealant. Now the manufacturers will tell you their MLS gaskets don't need it, but it doesn't hurt anything and it's just a little extra insurance with the boost we'll be running. Our aluminum cylinder head castings are from Indy Cylinder Heads. These giant combustion chambers are CNC cut and sized at 172 and a half cc's. With the smaller 40 cc piston dome, that'll make the compression ratio just 9.2 to 1. May seem a bit low, but this is a street engine and that lower compression level allows it to be pump gas safe even when we're pushing plenty of boost and horsepower. Anyhow, these valves are dinner plate sized at 2 inches 400 thousandths for the intakes and an inch 940 thousandths for the exhaust. Larry installs the ARP studs that thread into the cylinder heads and will slot down into the block. And then they're ready to be carefully lowered into place. Here, you can see the bosses in the valley that those studs fit into. These are directly underneath the intake ports of the head, so a conventional head stud here just wouldn't work in this location. Check out that straight shot into the intake port. These ports are huge, so although the combustion chambers are CNC cut, the ports are left as cast. All 16 valve springs are from Pack Springs. They have an installed height of an inch 900 thousandths, and at that height exert approximately 220 pounds of pressure against the seat. They are held in place with a set of steel retainers. To help provide a greater area for the tips of the rocker arms to roll over, Larry installs lash caps. These hardened steel caps also provide a bit of protection to the top of the valve stems. They just pop right on top. The shaft mount rocker arm setup drops fully assembled directly onto the cylinder head. That's why the center row of head studs are so tall and so far haven't been bolted down. Now this setup is also from Indy Cylinder Heads and check out that ridiculous offset on the intake rocker arms. Those are the ones on top so that they can reach from the push rods to the top of the valve stems. Now Larry installs the washers and nuts onto the last of the head studs and tightens each to 80 pounds in sequence. The underside studs, however, are only torqued to 70 pounds using a crow's foot on the torque wrench. That's because the studs are threaded into the aluminum cylinder heads and not the cast iron block. And Larry doesn't want to risk pulling the threads out of the aluminum heads. When you use a crow's foot, you have to account for the extra length on the end of the torque wrench and how it can affect the torque reading. Usually, there are instructions with the crow's foot set or you can find them online which allows you to do the math so you know that you are getting exactly the torque you're looking for. By the way, this is also a step where you really need to be careful. Of course, no matter how watchful you are, stuff can happen. Like when Larry accidentally dropped one of the nuts and it fell through the lifter bore and all the way to the bottom of the pan. Annoying, but hey, life. We took a magnet and tried fishing through the old drain hole but we were still unable to reach the nut. 
That left the only option to pull the pan. But that meant the engine had to be spun back upside down to reinstall the oil pan. So before doing that, Larry finishes locking down the bolts to secure the rocker shafts to the stands. These are torqued to 30 foot pounds. And once that was done, he removed the pan bolts and dropped the oil pan to retrieve that wayward nut. This kind of stuff happens even to the best of us. Ain't no shame in messing up as long as you fix your mistakes. Now, I'll take a little break from filming to help Larry clean up that torn head gasket off the oil pan rails. Anyhow, you may have noticed that we've already installed and bolted down the rocker arms, but we don't have either the lifters or push rods in place yet. This is bass backwards with most engine builds, but it actually makes sense on a Hemi. Since all eight rockers on each side have to be lowered into place at once, it can be a pain to get the entire assembly bolted down with the lifters and rockers already in place. Instead, this procedure seems to work quite well. First, Larry installs the high quality solid roller lifters. I think these are from BAM, making sure to check that each roller spins smoothly before placing them into the lubricated lifter bores. Notice how the nuts threaded onto the studs extending down to the lifter valley are practically behind the link bars on the lifters once they're in place. This is another reason why the heads must go on first, because you just can't reach them with the lifters in place. Now we can drop in the push rods. These are from Manton with traditional push rod cups and measure out to 10 inches 350 thousandths for the intakes and 11 inches 300 thousandths for the exhaust. A little high pressure lube on the ends helps protect them during initial startup on the dyno and they are ready to go. But the push rods aren't dropped in as a batch. Instead, Larry slides one of the rockers back on its shaft. It's only those lightweight springs that hold them in position after all, and then drops the push rod into position. The engine is rotated, by the way, so that the rocker we're working on is on the heel of the cam. Then he backs the rocker lash adjuster all the way out or loose so that the rocker easily slides over the top of the push rod cup. Once that's done, he tightens the adjuster back down and now we're ready to rotate the engine as necessary and move on to the next push rod in the series. When Larry tightened down the last adjusters during the assembly stage, he basically just worked by feel. But now that the entire valve train is finally in place, he can go back and dial in the cold lash. We're looking for 18 thousandths cold for both the intakes and exhaust which should get us close to the hot target of 26 thousandths valve lash. And of course, it'll be rechecked hot on the dyno. Now, let's move on. For the oil pump, Prestige is using a Melling high volume pump. And if you aren't familiar with the second gen Hemi, the engineers put the pump on the outside of the block on the driver's side. That just creates an extra leak path, which stinks, but at least the oil filter mount is right up front and easy to reach. The oil pump drive shaft slides in through the interior of the engine where the oil pump drive gear can mesh with the gear on the camshaft. Now we're just doing this as a pre-fit to make sure everything fits and it'll come right back out. That's because we'll pre-lube the engine on the dyno and the actual oil pump drive shaft can't be in the engine when you do that. Finally, we are ready for the fun part that giant roots blower. But it seems everything when it comes to high-end performance engine building requires modification. In this case, Prestige is putting EFI and computer controls on the engine, so they wanted manifold boost reference ports in the intake plenum. To handle that, Larry drilled and tapped holes for two eighth inch pipe plugs in the back of the intake. This provides a port for the ECU and the second for a gauge if the car owner wants it. Once that was done and all the metal chips washed out of the intake, we're ready to get on with the build. Here, Larry has already glued on the intake gaskets and he's laying a bead of silicone on the china rails to seal the bottom of the intake manifold. And then the intake can be carefully lowered into place. Fasteners are small, 
but there are plenty of them. And here's a shot looking through the plenum. We'll be using the big 1071 blower to literally shove air and fuel through the ports, but it's still good to see a nice clean design to get the combustion charge into the chambers. Another nice thing about this casting is it was designed to accept fuel injection. The pegs Larry's installing are struts that will support the fuel rails. The fuel injectors we're using have a 48 pound per hour capacity. If you think that seems a little small for this engine, you're probably right. We've got eight here, but in total, there will actually be 16 injectors on this engine. More on that in a little bit. Also, check out these sweet valve cover castings. There's no sleeping on the fact that this is a stroker motor here. The burst panel to protect the twin screw supercharger in the event of a backfire mounts right to the front of the intake manifold. Even if you never need it, and hopefully you won't, this is the kind of thing that lets people know you like to party. The distributor for this bad boy is an MSD dual sink which can tell the ECU the position of both the crankshaft and the cam. We're putting it in now because we need to know if it fits with the entire blower assembly as it goes into place. When you're mixing and matching parts on a custom build, that's never a guarantee. Now we can continue with the blower installation. Larry installs these tall studs in the intake manifold because we'll actually be sandwiching in an intercooler which will help drop the temperature of the incoming air fuel charge. The intercooler is a polished billet super chiller unit. It's an air to water intercooler with ports on the front and back. We'll get it all plumbed up for the water on the dyno. And once that's in place and a gasket on top, we can turn our attention to the massive 1071 roots blower. This is a BDS unit with a fully CNC cut billet case. BDS says the helical rotors are hard anodized for long service life and that black anodizing on the aluminum case just looks sick. This 1071 blower is physically huge. For example, those rotors inside the case are 17.1 inches long and move an astounding 469 cubic inches of air per revolution. With the blower in place on top of the intercooler, this Hemi is starting to gain some serious height. But wait, it only gets better. The rotors are gear driven inside the case, but BDS does require you to bolt up the primary drive. Once that's on, we can begin working out the front drive systems for both the blower as well as the alternator. To manage all that, the water pump needs to be bolted up. Larry installs the impeller on the two-piece Mopar water pump. And then, once the pump is in its proper spot on the front of the block, Larry can begin working out the pulley system and how he wants it all to fit. The reason this is all custom is because when it comes to big blower engines, most builders just let the giant blower drive belt function as a sort of an engine damper. It's an old racing trick, but this is a street car and Prestige believes the long-term performance and durability will be improved with a proper damper over the nose of the crank. This extra depth requires a little custom work to get everything to fit. By the way, remember how I told you that the stroker crank required us to run part of the oil pickup externally? Here it is all complete. The AN fittings keep the line nice and tight to the block so it won't get in the way. And this whole setup actually looks pretty trick. So let's move on to the rest of the top of the engine, which just keeps growing taller by the minute. This plate, plums in a second set of eight injectors, which will push fuel through the supercharger to help keep it cool. These eight injectors are also identical 48 pound per hour units. And now we'll be able to provide this big 572 with all the fuel it cares to burn. Prestige's Justin Zanotti takes over on the build for a bit because he's handling the wiring. This beautiful aluminum blower hat you don't see these often in street applications because we'll be basically going without an air filter, but the Roadrunner won't be a daily driver anyway. And man, does that just look phenomenal or what? 
This little doohickey right here is the throttle position sensor that'll work with a Holly HP ECU. We're only going to be spinning the big blower and an alternator in this application. There's no power steering pump on this one. So, with all that done, we're ready to move over to the dyno. And you can see just what a monster this build actually is. All the engine controls are being handled by Holly HP ECU. An interesting aspect of the HP is that to get all 16 injectors working, the top eight in the plate above the supercharger had to be batch fired. This wasn't an issue because the top injectors are there to provide a steady flow of fuel through the blower and exact timing isn't an issue. For fuel supply, Prestige simply teed off from the main fuel line. The steel braided hose fed the port fuel injectors and the black line fed the upper injectors. So, let's get started. Notice that traditional blower surge at idle. It's just plain glorious. Now, that's not necessary with an EFI and computer controls, but the customer wanted that old school sound so Senior at Prestige worked his magic and gave the engine that distinctive surge at idle. But enough of that, let's make some horsepower. For this pull, we have a large 60 tooth upper pulley installed to slow down the blower and reduce overall boost. This is basically the street trim, and we're even burning 93 octane pump gas. So, you know, just your everyday 572 cubic inch Hemi with a 1070 blower in a daily driver setup. Anyhow, let's see the chart. On the dyno, Prestige ran the pull from 3,500 to 6,400 RPM. The horsepower numbers were still going up at 6,400, but that's the safety red line for this engine. With that big old four and a half inch stroke, we don't want to be spinning this thing to the moon after all. Still, with just 5.7 pounds of boost, that's the baby puke green line at the bottom, and the scale for boost is on the right of this chart. We saw 907 and a half horsepower at 6200 rpm and 848.8 foot pounds of torque at 4400 rpm and senior at prestige says the engine will be happy doing that all day long after all prestige is one of the few engine shops that actually sends their engines out with a warranty of anywhere between one to three years anyhow 900 horsepower is nothing to sneeze at, but if you know us at all, then you'll know we didn't stop there. Senior pulled the big 60 tooth upper pulley and replaced it with a smaller 54 tooth pulley. And I'm sure you already know, reducing the size of the upper pulley in relation to the lower pulley on the crank spins the blower faster to produce more boost. We'll just call this happy time setup our race trim. Oh, and we also replaced the 93 octane with VP C16 race gas. Hook up the disco ball, it's time to party. This time around, thanks to the smaller pulley, the boost jumped up a little over two pounds and power was improved 
all the way across the pool. Peak power broke the grand mark with 1,013 and a half horsepower at 6,400 RPM. And average horsepower across the pool also improved by 65.4. Peak torque, meanwhile, was up 63.1 to 911.9 foot-pounds. Let's just go ahead and call that 912 at 4,700 RPM. Now, I don't know about you, but I love this engine. It was practically born to turn tire rubber into clouds. Granted, there are easier ways to make a thousand horsepower with the more modern, efficient engine designs we have these days, but you've got to admit, few engines bring the noise quite like a second gen Hemi. Hey, thanks for watching. Check out these other great videos. And if you don't mind, please leave this video a thumbs up and a comment. It really does help the channel and we love to know what you think. See you next time with another great engine build.